we had submitted some bios to Bob, um, but I think we'll just each provide a little background information for you so you've got a little context. So I'm Kent Johnson. Uh, I'm a longtime member of the Kayaptoish chapter of Trout Unlimited since uh, the late 1980s. And I've done an extensive amount of monitoring on the trout streams in our jurisdiction, including temperature monitoring, a lot of habitat monitoring in conjunction with our restoration projects, and of course, macroinvertebrate monitoring, uh, which is kind of my real love in uh, angling life here and the science behind it. Um, I've got a bachelor's degree in biology from St. Olaf College in Northfield and then a master's degree in aquatic biology, specifically aquatic entomology from Michigan Tech University, did my research on aquatic macroinvertebrates on Isle Royale National Park. And then I worked at the uh, Metropolitan Council, which is a regional government here in the Twin Cities for almost 40 years as an environmental scientist and then managing their water monitoring programs across the metro area. Um, so th that's me, and I'll let Clark introduce himself as well. Well, I'm Clark Airy. I uh, retired in 2006 from UW River, River Falls, where I taught zoology, uh, general biology, entomology. Um, I got my bachelor's. Is this working? I can't really tell. Thanks. Um, I got my master's in zoology. Uh, I got uh, a master's in entomology, and then I got my PhD in entomology as well. So um, I've kind of been uh, stuck in the bug world for a pretty long time, uh, not including my childhood. But um, I uh, started having um, projects uh, designed around sort of exploratory projects for my students. And of course, the South Fork was right out the back door of our, our building. So we would go down there and um, do all kinds of uh, collecting and identifying. And um, for some reason, I, I kind of got, got caught up in all of it. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go into the literature. I'm going to get a real good background on what's, what's living in, in, in the Kinnikinnik and in watershed. And I couldn't find anything. So. I went everywhere I could, talked to everybody I could, got all kinds of questions from, from uh, fisher folk. And um, eventually uh, I realized I, if I wanted to have this comprehensive list, I was gonna have to make one for myself. And that was in the uh, 1990s, started putting that all together. And um, eventually, uh, to make a long story short, I did a, a comprehensive uh, survey of the Kinney, did it for two years, 17 sites, uh, year round, and um, that's sort of was my uh, springboard for uh, carrying on with with that activity. Um, Kent and I got back together uh, a couple years ago and um, started uh, looking for money for a project, and you know, uh, collect the data for a couple of years. We've got a couple more years to go on this project, and um, I hope that uh, we can. We can explain it in such a way that you'll appreciate uh, what, what we've gotten done and uh, what we can learn from this kind of work. So you got the first slide? I do, yes. Hopefully we can coordinate this. We're gonna pass back and forth here from, from slide to slide. So move this way. All right. Um, so thanks for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, and basically, we want to focus a little bit on the project that we've got underway in the Kinnikinnick River. So uh, Kinnikinnick River macroinvertebrate monitoring past, present, and future, with the past being the incredible amount of work Clark put into um, identifying invertebrates in the Kinney in 2001 and 2002. So that's been our past. Uh, we've got a four-year project underway now to revisit all of those 17 sites using a couple different protocols and inventorying the river now. So you'll see some of the preliminary results tonight comparing what was present in the river in 2002 versus what was present uh, in 2022 because we hadn't revisited this in 20-plus years. Um, 
The other thing we want to do tonight is kind of set the stage for how we can use this information in the future, because uh, bug monitoring is a long-term process. To identify these trends takes long-term data, as we I think we both discovered this as we've been investigating some of the literature, because Bob Luck charged us with uh, a, a preface here of spending some time looking at the bigger picture. So what is happening with insect populations uh, in the region, in United States, North America, around the world, which uh, the more we were looking into this question, uh, the more intimidating it became because there's been a lot of research on the topic out there. So um, I think we'll start with an overview, the best we can describe of uh, trends going on around the world and then kind of zero in toward the end here on what's going on in the kinney as best we can determine up to this point. Um, Clark did a lot of the deep diving into the research I think we all know that Trout Unlimited, first and foremost, is a science-based organization. So a lot of the literature searches we conducted were on peer-reviewed literature that are first and foremost grounded in science to give us the best answers uh, to questions. So that's kind of been our approach. And um, so we'll share some of that with you and then talk more about what the Kinney Project has been all about. So when we were starting to get our this this section uh, in some sort of uh, non chaotic state, I put this slide together, and I'd like for you to go ahead and if you haven't uh, uh, seen some of these, go ahead and read them and and try to process these. Um, these are all from uh, you know well well researched, uh, very very high level, uh, high quality. Um, uh, research uh, finding, and um, when I went back to this after I had put it together, I started to think, well, okay, I, I want to think about how this makes me feel. If I start at this, what 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 is my thinking process, and uh, wh where does it actually end up? So I asked myself these questions: What does this mean? What does this big picture mean that that we see? How can we process this? Are the insect declines that are have been recorded, are they related to the uh, declines that we've seen in reptiles and amphibians and birds? And we, because those have been well-researched. Can this issue inform us regarding our local aquatic insects? And closest to home, maybe, is can we detect changes in insect populations in our home waters? So I hope to, with that sequence of questions, go sort of from the big picture down to the uh, more uh, local picture. Um, for some help on this, uh, I go to a meeting that occurred in uh, 2019 in St. Louis. It was a meeting held by the Entomological Society of America for the express purpose of trying to figure out what popula population trends are, are occurring, what, what trends are in place. This is against a background of ah, it does work. against a background of a lot of uh, headlines that we get uh, through the popular press. And we can never be sure if those aren't scientific peer-reviewed papers. You can never be sure if you know if if those are as valid as we might think they are. So um, four topics were covered by this meeting. Um, what, what are the trends? Where are the data gaps that we need to fill in? Importantly, and um, very, very uh, openly, what are the stressors that are underlying the, the declines? And then are there activities that can be used to mitigate these declines? Uh, in addition to the stressors, which I've highlighted there, the, the idea of having more data is always uh, uh, a necessity. So, um, if you're interested in this topic, and I, I really would highly recommend uh, you exploring this meeting, if, if you're interested, 
I have linked at the top, you can click on where it says uh, Entomology Symposium. It will take you right to the meeting. It will take you to a place where you can uh, click on 11 different presenters, 15 minutes each, and hear what they have to say about these different stressors and what they think is going on. Two years after the meeting, this paper came out, and you can click on that and uh, read those results. But I, I would encourage you, if, you want, if you're interested in it, you can read the abstract, you can read the introduction, you can read the conclusions with no problem, you can read the whole thing if you like. You, it's it's a, a, a good learning process. So a little bit about stressors. These are things that um, maybe we uh, visit or hear about one by one. We don't think about them maybe acting many of them at the same time. So what, what came out of the meeting, and, and one of the themes was this idea of, whoops, of uh, death by a thousand cuts. The, the very first time that I heard this, uh, this sort of saying used in relation to insects and in the, the plight of insects was at this meeting. When you think about all the stressors, that is possible to be acting on insects, insect populations. Um, they're all they're all serious, and then when you think about them acting at the same time, they're they're serious problems. So uh, all of these, most of these, were addressed in some detail at this meeting. And uh, this uh, illustration was one that uh, was placed in the follow-up paper. I thought it was pretty explanatory. The natural world tells us what's going on by having a reduction in abundance or a reduction in species. We have, we have to be able to interpret that. And then for uh, the purpose of maybe uh, expanding on uh, stressors, uh, I picked out two. I picked out habitat destruction and neonicotinoids. Um, this paper by Houghton and DeWalt, read the title, The Caddis Aren't All Right, Modeling Trichopter Richness in Streams at the North Central United States Reveals Substantial Species Losses. And they came down to the conclusion, after a lot of work, many, many years, that most of these losses were related to water shed level habitat disturbance. If you'd like to look at that paper, and again, um, it's not that hard to read, you, you can click on that link. The other thing that maybe you've already seen, which I would uh, recommend very highly, is this, uh, this look at the neonics. And this uh, particular uh, video right here given by Mike Miller at the 2023 Drifter Symposium. I, I'm assuming you've, you've seen this, you may, maybe haven't. You can click on that and watch the video. It's an it's in, incredible uh, thing to see. And resulting from that uh, study that uh, Mike did, neonics were detected in 85% of the 100 Wisconsin streams that he looked at. Many at levels that would affect behavior would be toxic at various levels for insects. This, this is Wisconsin streams. And the insects that were particularly impacted were the ephemeroptera, that's mayflies, the trichoptera, caddisflies, and the diptera, which would be the true flies, probably mostly uh, in the form of the midges. What that means is, how is it changed from the, the natural order? It, uh, it would say, uh, with, with the correlations that were being made, uh, what, what, were, what surrounded this stream? Um, you know, was it uh, uh, row crops? Or was it forest? Was it wetland? Was it pasture? That's the, that's the level that that, that was uh, determined for. 
It looks like yours. All right, I'm up and I'm gonna talk a little bit, if you'll allow me to spend a little bit of time on this, uh, talk about hexagenia, which is one of my favorite mayflies. Because uh, when I worked at the council, we spent 30 years looking at hexagenia emergences along the upper Mississippi River, um, largely from St. Paul down to um, Lake Pepin. But then we collaborated with a larger network uh, to extend all the way down past La Crosse down to the Quad Cities. So uh, this long-term monitoring network, I'll say more about that in a little bit. But in order to understand insect trends, Populations are highly variable. And to get around that noise, which occurs oftentimes year to year, you have to see the long picture. And unless you've got long-term monitoring going on, that's really difficult to see through the noise related to insect population trends. So um, uh, the hexagenia trends are a good example of that, ups and downs and ups and downs um, in these populations. Um, so I'm going to draw a little bit here from Stepanian et al., a paper that was published in 2020 that looks specifically at hexagenia trends, primarily in the eastern Great Lakes, uh, Huron and Erie. And then the Upper Mississippi River, and by Upper Mississippi River from the Twin Cities down to the Quad Cities, um, Davenport, Iowa. Uh, so a fairly long stretch of the Mississippi. So uh, they concluded looking at long-term data sets that in the middle of the 20th century, there were enormous summertime emergences of hexagenia particularly in um, Lake Erie and the Upper Mississippi River Network, and I'll show you a couple pictures here in a minute. Uh, by 1970, and this was in the uh, 1950s when these were occurring, 20 years later, they'd largely disappeared. And this disappearance was the result of what we call point source pollution coming from pipes industrial pipes, municipal wastewater treatment plant pipes, or lack of wastewater treatment entirely. And uh, so what changed then with these insect declines was the Clean Water Act was passed in 1970, and it mandated that industries and municipalities treat their sewage that was being discharged into surface waters. And when that happened, there was almost an instantaneous turnaround in water quality. And, uh, and bugs responded, they returned uh, en masse to both Lake Erie and the Upper Mississippi River Network. Um, now, uh, with 30 years of trend monitoring that the council and other agencies conducted in the Upper Mississippi, Populations were relatively robust, uh, and our studies went from mid-80s to around 2015. And uh, during the latter part of that period, uh, folks picked up on the fact that National Weather Service radar imaging that tracks weather systems can track these mayfly emergences because they're so prolific. So the radar was picking these up, Radar technology even got to the point where it could estimate the numbers of mayflies in the swarms, the emergences. And uh, so that technology has been used in the last decade or so, applied to uh, Lake Erie and the upper Mississippi River. Now what it looks like after mayflies returning for a period is that in the Mississippi River, there's been a 50% decline in these populations over the last decade. So up down, up, down, and we'd only know this because of long-term monitoring. So here's a few pictures of what those hatches look like and look like. This fellow over here is uh, Dr. Cal Fremling. Uh, he was a professor of biology at Winona State University. He loved hexagenia. For him, it was the identity of the Mississippi River. He began monitoring emergences in the 60s continued in the 70s, 80s, 90s. I collaborated with him on a paper on hexagenia recurrence in the Mississippi and the Twin Cities area. So that's him covered during a hex hatch. And that's one of his uh, collaborators uh, sampling from a pile of emergent hexagenia. 
Now, there are two species on the Mississippi. Bilineata is the most prolific, and Limbata, the yellow one, is mixed in at times as well. And then more recently, in 2010, this is a shot of Lake Pepin uh, with one of the Minnesota DNR staff out sampling during a mayfly swarm. And, you know, the, the way the public views this is um, yeah, flash mobs or bizarre creatures of the Mississippi. They're slimy. They make a mess. They coat bridges and streets and people skid around in these in these piles so but what they're really needing to understand is these are um, mayflies that are indicative of clean water so we should be celebrating the fact that they're here rather than um, these headlines suggesting otherwise so so these were a couple photos from the I'd say 2010-ish from the councils and the Upper Mississippi Rivers Monitoring Network. So this is one of, oh, sorry. This is one of our monitoring sites at Red Wing Lock and Dam 3, the morning after an emergence. So you can see it's kind of in the shade here. This is a pile of hexagenia bilineata under the lights above this door and a nice carpet along the walkway of the lock and dam. So this is how prolific, how much biomass, imagine what's underwater available for the fish community and what's available for the fish community when they're on the water surface and the aerial community that's feasting on all of this when an, when an emergence occurs. And then uh, my, one of my collaborators, John Sullivan, uh, downriver at La Crosse, Wisconsin DNR, the Pepsi machines were delivering hexagenia, apparently, <laughs> for free, all you want. Um, yeah. So I think what it shows here is ups and downs, ups and downs, long-term monitoring is critical, and uh, the most recent information suggests that maybe something's going on along the Mississippi that uh, we need to keep an eye on. Um, so when Clark and I were studying literature on trends, uh, we did run across uh, some positive news as well. So there are a couple papers. I'll get this figured out before the end. Uh, one by Crossley et al., uh, who concluded that uh, diversity declines and abundance declines were not apparent across U.S. long-term ecological research sites, and there was something like, uh, I'd say, 50 or so sites across the United States which combined both terrestrial and aquatic insects. So they did not see any trends. Um, and then also uh, Van Klink et al., um, these are primarily German authors, but they looked at data available from 160 locations across 41 countries worldwide. And uh, they also concluded there were slight declines in terrestrial insects and slight increases actually in freshwater insect communities at, at the research locations. So as we looked across all of these data sets, one thing kind of popped out. Um, and that was this, and these authors summarized it perfectly for us. So they said, local drivers of decline matter. Local stressors matter, just like Clark mentioned. And sometimes they're even too numerous to comprehend. Um, and recent studies have reported alarming declines in insect populations, and that's been apparent in the popular literature as well. But questions persist about the breadth and pattern of such declines, and usually they're based on where there's data available to analyze. So the, the, the patterns of variation suggest that these local scale drivers or stressors are probably responsible for many changes in population trends. Um, and what that does is it provides hope a lot of these things we can address and reverse like we did for point source pollution in the 1970s and 80s. So it's not beyond our grasp and um, it, um, 
there's something we can do about it if we focus on conservation and protection and restoration and speak out about these issues. Stand, stand closer. All right. All right. And I, at that uh, point, I turn it over to Clark. <laughs> I'll remember that for next time. So um, I'm supposed to go back over here. Uh, this is sort of a look back at, at what we've uh, what, what we've already uh, talked talked about, but um, just to see the the scope of this, and then a little bit about action, I guess, which um, is is the point. Uh, a letter was sent by um, this Jay Harvey and 59 or 58 other additional scientists uh, putting together a roadmap, what needs to be done on, on, on the highest level. And uh, they, it's, it's interesting, I think, that um, they, really, they really focused in on farming, habitat management, and urban development as areas where uh, possibly effective action, local action, and economic action should be taken. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting uh, when I found this, how that might fit into the larger picture. The European Union is ban you know, has banned several of these neonics. We've got it, we've got them in our water in Wisconsin. Isn't there somebody that could, you know, cry out and say, What's going on? Why do we need this? A lot of uh, a lot of politics in there, I suppose. The, the thing I liked about the Forrester et al. article is that they said, "Okay, let's go ahead and do something. We we don't have all the data that we need, but let's do the things regarding these stressors that we should be doing, reducing stressors, and then some sort of attempt to um, reduce declines." And they recommended that um, various levels of uh, jurisdictions could be involved in this, as well as people who are involved in working lands, natural areas, and even private uh, property owners. Okay, so to try to tie that up into some, some sort of uh, uh, series of comments. We know insect populations are declining worldwide. There's no question about that. At some level, uh, possibly in the one to three percent level. Of course, larger declines. We've we've read those stories as well. Large large numbers of butterflies uh, and uh, other flying insects. The the main the biggest declines are in areas of high human activity. Surprise, surprise. These uh, populations, populations of insects are very difficult to uh, keep track of. And um, that's, that's part of the problem is that we don't have the, uh, we don't have the ability to keep track of some of these. This means that studies should be long-term. We need baselines. Uh, landscape level uh, habitat disturbance is a critical issue. And uh, this quote uh, from an, an old stream-based uh, paper by Hines seems to say it all. In every respect, the valley rules the stream. We'll talk about species richness here in a bit. Um, and then from the Forrester paper, action. And finally, when you're reading the popular literature, read it, read it with caution and try to see where the information actually came from. So next, I think we wanna to transition to the Kinney and uh, one of our objectives of the current study was to try to determine if things have changed in the Kinney over the last 20 years since Clark did his comprehensive survey work. And uh, on top of that, you know, we'd kind of been hearing some reports from anglers here and there. Gee, the caddis hatches in the lower Kinney aren't what they used to be. 
trico hatches used to be better. Um, so in reality, are things changing in the Kinnikinnick River? And so the macroinvertebrate data will help us answer that question, but on the other hand, what will help lead us toward that answer is feedback from anglers on what your experiences have been um, over the last 20 years or so and your observations on the river. Um, because there have been a lot of you out angling and a lot of observations made. And uh, so we crafted a what we think is a short survey to get your feedback on that topic. And uh, so we'll distribute this at the end of the meeting. And so it might be just recollections from the back of your head. You might keep uh, fishing journals and notes that you would be willing to share with us. And as we build on this database that we're creating and uh, begin analyzing it, we can put some of this into a little bit better context and look at some of these very specific questions and thoughts that you're sharing with us. So we'll, we'll get back to this in, in a little bit. So why the heck are we monitoring bugs? Um, a couple things. Um, and I've been involved in the monitoring business with the council and Trout and Limited. So oftentimes we go out and we're making habitat measurements or we're taking samples for water chemistry analysis and trying to collect all of this information to see if there might be an effect on fish or bugs or vegetation in the stream. Well, why not go ask them how they're doing via biological surveys? Uh, the trout surveys are pretty common in the Kinney. In fact, they're, they're very, um, very good annual surveys being conducted right now, so we can look at trout trends. But um, as Marty Engel, our local fisheries manager for years, said, all of those trout under 16 inches are feeding almost exclusively on terrestrial and aquatic insects. So how are they doing? Well, um, so that's the dimension that invertebrates and fish and veg aquatic vegetation add to a monitoring program. They can give us an overall approximation of the ecological condition of these streams um, and integrate things that are otherwise difficult and or expensive to measure one by one. So in, these invertebrates have limited mobility. They're pretty much stay at home, um, although the adults disperse readily. Uh, they have <clears throat> longish lifespans for months to um, years, and they're good indicators of local water quality, which you'll see in some of the metrics that we'll be presenting shortly. Um, so in Wisconsin, um, Dr. William Hilsenhoff at UW-Madison picked up on the use of invertebrates as an indexing tool, 1977, and it's been adopted by Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and used ever since. So he developed the Hilsenhoff Biotic Index, or HBI, and we'll be showing you some of the HBI results on the Kinney as well. So in uh, 2022, we kicked off a comprehensive macroinvertebrate survey of the Kinney using a couple different sampling protocols, which you'll see here uh, shortly, and uh, repeating the work that Clark did at 17 sites along the entirety of the Kinney from the, the mouth here at the St. Croix River up near the Headwaters area. Uh, you'll see that nine of the sites are located in what we like to call the Upper Kinney, uh, five in the Lower Kinney, and a couple right within the city of River Falls, and then uh, the contributing tributaries as well. All of our survey work will be focusing on the main, or is focusing on the main stem of the Kinney. And here's a representative monitoring site number four. I'm here in the lower Kinney uh, with both sampling protocols being applied at this site and at all sites for that matter. So what kind of monitoring protocols are we using? Uh, two to be specific. Uh, I'll talk just briefly about each. The single habitat sampling protocol 
focuses on riffle areas exclusively. So we're looking for riffle specific, riffle inhabiting macroinvertebrates. And because of the quantitative nat nature of the sampling protocol, we can start um, calculating metrics that are indicative of the health of the river. And you'll see some of those coming up here. Uh, this protocol is widely used by Wisconsin DNR for water quality monitoring across the entire state. And it provides comparability from stream to stream so we can begin comparing health of rivers and streams across the entire state. And then we used it extensively uh, over a nine year period here for the River Falls North Kinney monitoring project. Uh, the multi-habitat sampling protocol that uh, Clark designed and used in 2001 and 2002 uh, is sampling all stream habitats present. So this is meant to be a habitat-wide inventory of hopefully everything that's present at a particular monitoring site. And that's uh, more of a presence-absence type protocol, but um, it's the best way to take an inventory of everything that's there. Uh, because all, all habitats are being represented. So like we mentioned, Clark used this to document the entire Kinney at 17 sites in 2001 and 2002. And I uh, neglected to mention those 17 sites were initially established by the, the uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So we just built on a network that was uh, already existing. The single habitat or HBI sampling protocol, a field work involved there is a sample consists of three subsamples. Uh, it's a kick sampling protocol whereby you stand upstream of a, a kick net, D-shaped kick net, and kick an area about of a third of a meter by a meter long. So with three subsamples, you're sampling one square meter roughly of that stream bottom in a riffle habitat. Um, uh, coincidentally, we're making habitat measurements, uh, things like water depth, current velocity, and particularly the type of substrate that's on the bottom of the river, because those are the three primary drivers of macroinvertebrate presence. Stream width, canopy cover, uh, some of the other contributing factors that might explain macroinvertebrate presence. This, the one sample at each site is then sent to um, the Aquatic Biomonitoring Laboratory at UW-Stevens Point, their taxonomous uh, subsample from our original sample in a randomized pattern and select a minimum of 250 specimens. And then all of those are identified to a minimum of genus and more commonly to species level. These people are really good at identifying bugs. In fact, they're the to-go-to lab for Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So they probably analyze hundreds of these samples a year. So I'm gonna say a little bit about the uh, multi-habitat sampling. And um, this uses the same tool as a, a single habitat, the uh, uh, D-net or kick net. Um, the idea here is to uh, sample 10 prevalent habitats at a, at a site. So you approach the site, you um, take a look around and try to see how many different habitats might be there. And then uh, you target 10 of those uh, for the process. So the, the net can be used in riffles as, as in the single habitat. But it can also be used in other kinds of uh, substrates. It can be used in silt. It can be used uh, through vegetation. And you can get, you can collect the fauna that's in those areas um, fairly proficiently. So um, the uh, process that I put together originally for my survey was uh, I would allow 12 minutes per habitat. So I would, in two minutes, I would get the sample. In the next 10 minutes, I would put the sample into a tray and I would pick out all the prevalent organisms, as many as I could in that 10 minutes. Put the debris back into the river, go get another habitat. So 10, 10 of those times 12 minutes is two hours. It takes two hours to do one of those samples. 
Um, they're like uh, single habitat, they're uh, pooled. Um, they pick 300 specimens out of that with, at, at the lab and get those identified exactly as uh, Kent had described. Um, when looking back on this and going, going forward with, with the same process, uh, trying to mimic what had been done in uh, 2001, 2002, I went back and put this, I call this a habitat pie. It's a, a summary of all the different kinds of habitats that uh, I, I uh, sampled um, at four sites. So this was, uh, you know, you're gonna see these sites uh, in just a few minutes, you're gonna see, uh, see them used uh, many times. But it's sites two, six, seven, and eight, so we're talking about down near County F, um, just below River Falls, uh, near Rocky Branch, in River Falls, near Division Street, and then up above the bypass. Uh, summarizing all of these should add up to 40 samples. Uh, and you can see that um, I, still, I still sampled the, uh, the riffles in 2002, but I tried to include other kinds of running water and other kinds of substrates. And then if you follow on around clockwise, um, the samples were taken with uh, debris of debris and uh, on up into the uh, various types of vegetation that were present at a site. So um, when Kent and I were brainstorming over this project, we we're trying to decide because it's not not an inexpensive process to get these uh, samples analyzed. Should we focus on one protocol or the other? And we 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 couldn't make up our minds, so we decided we better do both of them. It turns out that doing these two protocols together is very beneficial. If you're doing the single habitat protocol. Uh, you've got num. You're, well, first of all, you're getting a calculation of an HBI. You're getting a single index value for that site at that moment in time, and um, with that value, you can, you know, say there's another value here too. But you can go back and and you can start comparing these with other other sites at other at other uh, times uh, and other rivers if you want to do that. Um, and, Kent, are you going to talk more about biotic uh, index, the uh, macro and rubric? Um, yep. We also get another uh, metric here that's uh, very powerful called a macro invertebrate index of biotic integrity. So those are, those are some of the pluses from the single habitat. What you get out of the, the multi-habitat is you get a much broader look at this river community. And um, it's really amazing what you can get in addition to the riffle uh, populations, what you can get out of, out of the uh, various other habitats. Um, this is that uh, last, that picture that uh, Kent showed enlarged. You can see Kent's uh, flags here um, uh, where the, uh, he's working on this riffle for the samples, getting the three samples done. I'm over here on my hands and knees slaving away at a tray full of macroinvertebrates, picking them out uh, to see what we've got there. This is, a, this is site four, which is about halfway uh, between River Falls and uh, um, County F. Um, okay, so what, what we've done so far is um, these sites, 2022, the two, six, seven, and eight that I just mentioned. We also have two additional sites in here that are associated with uh, uh, dam uh, projects. <laughs> removal and uh, so on. And um, 2023, so th those are mostly in the, in, the, in the city area, except for site two. Then we uh, went to site four last year and uh, started to pick up some of the other sites that are downstream. And we started really doing the upstream sites, uh, 10, 12, and 14. Remember there are 17 of these. And then along with these, when these get sent to the lab, they also get my collection from 2002. So the whole process, the whole stream is exactly the same for what I, what I collected and what we collected, okay? Um, that means, you know, all the picking, all the gridding, 
um, all the microscope work and all that is done side by side. So we have, I feel like we've got nice comparable samples uh, to compare. Um, okay, now this, this is our, our first data slide. So I wanna say a little bit more about this. Um, here we have, uh, we're gonna have two years here 2002 and 2022, we're going to be looking at the metric known as uh, species richness. And um, sometimes it's said that it's a little disappointing to get a single number out of a sample, but this number is really an important number. And richness kind of says it all. And the more you think about it and you think about what went into that number, you're getting a community or part of a community or part of several communi communities that, that represent everything that's living there. The more things that are living there, the more they interact with each other. The more they interact with each other, the more uh, diverse and the more solid this community is, okay? So um, here we have, Okay, we, get, we have our x-axis here with sites two, six, seven, and eight, same ones talked about previously. Um, we've got a dividing line here between the lower kidney and the upper kidney if you just want to get a quick glimpse of that. Species richness is quantified here. And so here we have 2002, 2022, way downstream, a little bit closer together here in um, uh, site six. Site seven, this is interesting, uh, but maybe not terribly conclusive, but site seven, we look to see a slight, slight increase in species richness and even slighter here for site eight. Um, I, I, I tend to hold judgment on this difference. We, do, we don't know if that's statistically significant. What's gonna be exciting in the future, I think, is when we start to fill in right here with sites three, four, and five, and then we're gonna see, you know, what the lower kidney really looks like as far as species richness. And the same, the same over here when we start to go upstream um, from site eight. The next slide is uh, a subset of this one. Um, people who study uh, macroinvertebrates love the idea of, as I'm sure you all do, the, the idea of um, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And those are represented in EPTS species numbers, Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera. Okay, this is a special measure that macroinvertebrates always, <laughs> macroinvertebrate uh, people always come back to because this is how many combined mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies there are at these locations. This kind of mimics what we saw with the full population, but this is this is a very robust crowd, right? This is these are these are insects that are um, relatively intolerant to stressors, to uh, you know, all the all these potential bad things that could uh, surround them. And then we're always interested in, okay, it was collected in uh, 2002. What happens if we look at look for it in 2022? So I picked out, um, for your enjoyment, I picked out three betas, three species of betas, Grunea color, um, Flavistriga, and Trichidatus. And here they are at sites, or maybe absent from sites two, six, seven, and eight. Why didn't, why didn't I collect them at every site? Well, this is called sampling for a reason. You're not really looking at everything that's there. You're, you're getting a sample. And on that, if you, you know, my thought is, if I went back the next day, would I get it? And, and you very well might, but that's the way sampling works. You just have to live with that quality. Um, okay, so collected in 2002, I filled in a little bit with 2001 here just to make the picture a little more complete. Okay, what's gonna happen when we look at this column 
uh, where we collected in 2022 by both um, uh, multiple habitat and single habitat, and what kind of counts and percentages do we get? There's what we get. And again, that's sampling. So we do have a gap. We have a gap here, but uh, I tend to uh, disregard that with all the other results that we got. So in some cases, we're getting 100% of those betas re-represented, recollected, reoccurring at, at that uh, site. And with that, I will hand that over to Thanks. So what uh, Clark just shared with you is us embarking on a then past versus present comparison. And uh, so, and that was largely with, uh, we were able to do that because of multi-habitat sampling protocol. Um, so I'm gonna share with you some of the present results based on our limited sampling uh, conducted in 2022, just using the single habitat protocol. Um, we thought that by using both protocols, including single habitat, uh, we can also share these results in the Kinney with Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, which is recommending statewide use of the single habitat approach. So what you see here are, um, let me set up the slide. There'll be three more to follow this one, but sites two, six in the lower Kinney, seven and eight in the upper Kinney. And then as Clark mentioned, uh, in 2022, we also focused on covering some sites that were included in the Kinney monitoring plan that we put together to look at pre and post restoration conditions related to dam removal and river restoration. So in that plan, we slightly uh, changed the numbering system. So you'll see the Kinney monitoring plan numbering system here, but uh, sites two and 120 are the same, same for four, seven, eight, six, five, seven, four, seven, six, 52 and eight. So those are one and the same sites. So we collected single habitat samples at the same locations, obviously, that we collected the multi-habitat. What we added uh, due to the Kinney monitoring plan are these two sites, 504, which is located a couple hundred meters downstream from the Powell Falls or lower set of the two dams. And then we added a new monitoring site uh, as well in the new Lake Louise channel. Remember the drawdown occurred in Lake Louise in 2020, October, and uh, a new stream channel, New Kinney, cut its way through Lake Louise. So we set up a sampling location in that new channel area as well. So we're going back here to species richness, which Clark nicely defined. So these are total numbers of unique species that were present at each one of these monitoring sites. And what you see here are numbers uh, in the upper and lower Kinney that either approach or exceed 40. That's amazing um, diversity, uh, both in the upper and lower Kinney. And all these numbers are pretty much the same. And uh, Clark mentioned an important piece here that we haven't covered yet, mostly because we don't have much data, and that's uh, statistical comparisons of these numbers. So when we get more monitoring data, more sites populated, we can run some statistical tests here to see if 44 is different than 40 or 39. But the eyeball statistics say this is pretty similar and the numbers are high, which is good. It represents a healthy Kinney. Now this site in the new Kinney channel in Lake Louise, uh, I don't know. We, we haven't run the statistics, but it looks like an outlier. And uh, so as we go to the next slide, we're revisiting this metric, EPT species numbers, which Clark nicely defined, Femoroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera, the number of species in those three orders. And um, you see some differences here um, within the lower Kenny. This site 504 is kind of starting to pop out as we start to uh, add metrics to this picture. 
So it seems to be maybe a little bit more robust, but again, a pretty good comparison from upstream to downstream. But then again, this site and the new channel in Lake Louise, ah, eh, maybe not quite as robust as upper and lower. So something to keep an eye on there. Now, because we use the single habitat monitoring protocol, we can calculate some additional metrics that can't be used with the multi-habitat protocol. Uh, one of them is the Hilsenhoff Biotic Index, which I mentioned previously. It was first used in 1977, and it's based on tolerance values of the organisms present in the sample. And by tolerance values, I mean how sensitive are they to pollution? Um, if they're very insensitive, whoops, sorry, uh, insensitive, or very, I, I'm sorry, if they're very sensitive to the impacts of pollution, they have a tolerance value of zero. In other words, they don't tolerate it. If they're tolerant of pollution, on the other end of the scale, it's 10. Uh, they totally tolerate it in some situations. So based on that metric, uh, and this is a water quality metric. So we're measuring water quality using this index. And um, so the way this uh, maps out here is this category from zero to three and a half is excellent water quality down here. So it's kind of an inverse scale based on these tolerance values. This range, very good, good. Um, there, up here, and then there are three other categories that are primarily poor above that, but we didn't see any of that in the at the sites that we have sampled so far. So again, to take a look, uh, this 574 up at Division Street, excellent water quality. We've got a couple here um, up by the bypass, and again, the site 504 immediately downstream in the very good water quality category three upper and lower in the good water quality category and then or i'm sorry two in the good water quality category and then this again the site in lake louise only fair water quality and then uh, clark also mentioned macroinvertebrate index of biotic integrity or MIBI, and Wisconsin DNR uses this a lot, and they like it because it combines multiple macroinvertebrate metrics, and it also throws in the impacts of multiple stressors, so things like um, agricultural land use, the presence of livestock, the presence of urban urbanization, the amount of wet surface on the landscape, um, the condition of the stream bank and um, the bed of the stream, habitat heterogeneity. So all of those factors plus nine different uh, macroinvertebrate metrics get all rolled into this index and it's an index of river health. So this is the opposite scale. So better, uh, higher is better. So again, very poor down here, poor, fair, good, excellent. And uh, so we've got a couple of these sites, Division Street and uh, below the dam as good. Um, three sites really pretty much the same here um, in the fair category. And uh, then one down here, um, and it's the same one again, the new channel in Lake Louise in the poor category. So these are overall measures of stream health. So what's up with site 515? The nice thing about being able to use multiple metrics like this is it's kind of a weight of evidence. Things start recurring. You use one metric, uh, yeah, maybe two metrics, oh, it popped up again. Three metrics, uh, it's there again, and four, and so on. And now you've got a weight of evidence that suggests that maybe something is up at this location. Well. Um, so based on these multiple metrics that um, I just showed, um, the new kinney within Lake Louise is degraded. 
And uh, really, this isn't real surprising because some of the contributing factors here, uh, there's a lot of channel instability. And by that, I mean the channel is still trying to find its location laterally through Lake Louise. It's still wandering, looking for it. And because of that, they're real high um, incised banks. Eight to, these are eight to 10 foot high banks. Mm. So bank instability is high. There's a lot of sloughing, a lot of sediment being deposited in this channel. And uh, then, oh, by the way, there's still a Lake George upstream, which has its severe water quality problems. And that water's being passed on down through this and by this aquatic invertebrate community. So I think uh, the new Kinney will greatly benefit from river restoration after these dams come out. And um, hopefully, as we repeat this sampling post-dam removal and restoration, then we'll see a much improved macroinvertebrate community here. And we can use the same metrics uh, that we're using currently to kind of identify it as a degraded portion of the Kinney. All right, I think it's a, a turn over to you. I think we ought to shorten up while it's running. Uh, yeah, we could. How, how are we doing on time? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so real quick, uh, this, is, this is just a look at our uh, multi-habitat versus our uh, single habitat species richness at those sites. They're fairly comparable. We, we feel good about that. That's consistency. Uh, this shows uh, a little more utility of using the two together because in the blue and the green, we have the multi and the single. And we've added together then what we get in both as far as uh, species richness. This is EPT, by the way. Um, so um, you can see the, the strength in that comes about because we're, we're getting a... Um, a combination of, of species in our list rather than just one a metric or the other. I think we could skip these two. Yeah, yeah. I... Okay, and then that would be yours. Is this one of mine? All right. So the two previous slides just kind of summarized what we presented on uh, the indices and species richness and EPT richness. So, um, so overall, um, the number of macroinvertebrate species that have been documented in the Kinney based on Clark's 2002 collections and our 2022 collections using both protocols is 80 plus. That's looking across all sites, which is remarkable. Um, so overall, a, a very solid macroinvertebrate community in the Kinney. Um, and furthermore, if you look across all of these species, they're relatively evenly distributed, which is good. That is a good component of richness. You don't want an, a system that's dominated by one or two species because usually what's happened there is there's some sort of stressor or pollution, com pollution impact coming to bear that's favoring a few species but eliminating most of them. Uh, so number of orders averaged um, eight in 2002, seven in 2022, pretty similar. Uh, what was always present and overlap were mayflies, stoneflies, caddis, beetles, uh, the diptera, and uh, amphipods, and less consistently present, the damselflies, dragonflies, and the uh, sowbugs. And then if we drop down a taxonomic level, number of families, 16 in 2002, 14 in 2022. And really those were not statistically significant and all based on multi-habitat data. And then the second part of that summary is um, uh, uh, just some, um, some statements. Um, we're, we're seeing fairly consistent uh, species richness across all, all of these sites and across the years. Caddisfly species richness is an interesting number because we're right now, we think we're in about the range of 26 or maybe a little bit better. 
Um, that paper by uh, Houghton and DeWalt that I mentioned earlier here um, categorizes uh, the uh, degradation or the dis disturbance in areas by the number of uh, caddis fly species that are present there. And um, for uh, uh, a less disturbed stream in the north central United States, the average is 30 species. I don't think we found all of the ones that are there yet, but we got more work to do. Uh, recollection or recollection uh, shows consistency of the mayflies, stoneflies, and, and caddisflies from 02 to 22. HBI values are generally good, excellent, very good, and good, and fair. And the MIBI values uh, that we got in 2022 show good for the most part one fair and one poor. Of course, the fair and the poor in those two categories are, are site 515. Let me quickly wrap this up. So the first two years of monitoring, uh, we covered the site shown by the red arrows here, 2022-2023. Uh, this year, we're planning to catch uh, sites three, five in the lower river, and then uh, nine and 11 in the upper river. And then uh, two, 2025 will be mostly focused on the remaining sites in the upper river, and then adding this uh, site one down near the St. Croix River confluence. Both types of samples, and then the 2002 multi-habitat samples also analyzed. Uh, acknowledging a few folks who have been involved with the project. Um, as Clark mentioned, uh, it's some expense involved in analyzing these samples to draw on the taxonomic expertise that's needed um, to do this. So Kayaptawish has been a very generous funder. They've committed to the four year span of this project and will be covering all the lab costs. However, uh, Kinney Corridor Collaborative covered about 50% of the costs of analyzing the 2022 data, which we presented tonight. The rest has been entirely volunteer, so included in the field work, Kinney CC Stream Team. Uh, these, these three folks, uh, Reed is shown here. Uh, Sean Morrison at Interfluv. Uh, Doctors Wheeler and Rader at UW River Falls, and uh, Dr. Wheeler's been very helpful as one of the field monitoring participants. Uh, and then John Kaplan with our Kaptoist chapter have been our, our field monitoring specialists. All samples have gone through the Aquatic Biomonitoring Lab at UW-Stevens Point. Jeff Dimmick and his staff have been remarkable, to say the least. So uh, we lean heavily on their taxonomic expertise to make this happen. Um, our email addresses are here if you have any follow-up questions that we aren't covering tonight. So feel free to get in touch with us. I'll also mention that we do have a report on the first year of monitoring 2022, which provides a lot more information than we had time to present tonight. Um, a lot of the details around the monitoring work and the metrics. So feel free free to visit that. It's on the CAIAP website in our cold water science library. So um, I think at that point, we'd be happy to entertain some questions. So my first question, are you guys encouraged or discouraged by everything? I, I'm, encur I'm encouraged. I've seen that I have the perspective uh, maybe of uh, 20 years. And um, I think the data so far uh, is looking pretty good. All right. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. All right. Do we have questions? Oh, I got to run around the room. Can either of you make a guesstimate as to which critters make up the bulk of the biomass? In other words, uh, you know, like it, it takes a whole bunch of betas bugs to make up one uh, Gamera species. So what, what critters make up the bulk of the biomass 
food available to the fish? That's a good question because the analysis does not include uh, the biomass component. But if I, ha if I had to guess, one of the groups that uh, we didn't represent well tonight, and this is one of the metrics, you know, the ABL lab delivers us 30 metrics to work with. So I would suggest that chironomids, the family Chironomidae, is a very significant presence in the kinney. And uh, usually the numbers of chironomids are probably a little bit higher than some of the other numbers um, within the other orders. So midges yeah sorry and i would say also that um we probably seen 25 30 different species of uh, midges within the family chironomidae so a very impressive presence of course it varies from site to site depending on habitat but yeah uh, it's they're, they're extremely prevalent and they uh, they're very diverse okay other questions Ron, raise your hand. So would you care to guess or extrapolate from the Kinney to the rivers in southeastern Minnesota? I mean, the Kinney seems very healthy. So are we to assume that those that healthy environment also exists in southeastern Minnesota in the driftlets there? Or is there something special about this Kinney? I, I would not want to extrapolate at all. Kinney results beyond the Kinney be, be, simply because a lot of the presence absence is so place-based. Uh, depends on river dynamics, habitat availability, amount of groundwater input, impacts in the watershed. Um, all of these multiple stressors that Clark mentioned come out in different ways depending on what river and what reflection of the watershed that river is. So, but I think we can say with limited information, the Kinney's in pretty good shape and it compares reasonably well to what was there uh, 20 years ago. Pretty good. It was interesting to see the data you have on neonix and the levels that are in the streams. Is there anyone doing any research on nitrates as far as levels in streams, and also the, is anyone studying the effect of nitrates on insects directly? Yeah, let me take that. Thanks to um, Jim Sauter. Uh, there's a volunteer monitoring program underway here at TCTU with uh, eight some streams that the chapter has adopted and using test strip technology to look at uh, nitrate nitrogen concentrations in these streams. And uh, there's been a broader effort across the driftless area to do the same thing with a mobile water quality app. So crowdsourcing this information is really important and it's resulted in some great data for uh, locations where it would otherwise not be present. We have no information at all. But I think based on a lot of agency monitoring that's gone on around the state of Minnesota, we can say that nitrates in these water sources are a definite concern, not only in the flowing water, but in the groundwater underneath that's contributing to the streams and that uh, residents are using for drinking water. And uh, so part B of that question, um, we know what the drinking water standard is for safe consumption of water, based on nitrate presence, and that's 10 parts per million or milligrams per liter. So anything above that, you're treading on dangerous <clears throat> territory with regard to nitrate concentrations in your drinking water. Um, toxicity to uh, aquatic life and aquatic insects is not as well known. Uh, usually that's driven by lab studies conducted by Environmental Protection Agency, and they develop criteria that are adopted as water quality standards by the state or not to exceed levels. So EPA and the states are working on a nitrate standard right now. That's been in progress uh, since before I retired, probably 10 or 15 years. 
So I, you know, you get into the politics of this situation as well. So it's like, what don't we want to know <laughs> about aquatic life toxicity within our receiving waters? Um, public health, of course, you know, that's first and foremost, we got to protect ourselves. But after that, mm, I don't know what we want to know. So so hopefully at some point there will be a standard for nitrate, which will say you can't exceed this level if you want to protect aquatic insects or fish or other in aquatic inhabitants. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for your really good presentation from both of you. It was fantastic. Uh, that in mind, are you going to share this out in some way? Uh, definitely, that, that's the plan. Um, we just kind of presented a snippet tonight, so we're 25% of the way through. And I think, as Clark mentioned, by filling in the spaces, we'll get a much better picture of the health of the kinney and where changes may have occurred over the last two decades and where changes are apparent in the system right now. Uh, and then hopefully we can relate that a little bit to some of the possible stressors if we identify problem areas. Uh, the other thing is, um, I'll note that uh, uh, Carl Nelson and his team have just completed uh, an extensive macroinvertebrate survey of the Rush River, uh, which is also a popular angling destination in the, in the Kayaptowish woods over there. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to make that comparison using some of the same metrics as well. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we're working toward a report on all of the, the Kinney results uh, once we get all of the monitoring complete and we can assemble all four years of data. Uh, but um, in terms of the project and the protocols and the preliminary results in 2022, we did want to get a report out uh, to kind of set the stage for what's to come later. Pardon? I believe Carl is working on it right now. I have one more question for you. I, I should have asked it when you were in the midst of the slide, but you were on a roll. Um, it's a protocol question. So let me see if I can recollect this correctly. Um, I think you talked about a 12 minute procedure with the first two minutes where you'd get a dip net sample. And then that was, if I have this correct, poured into a sampling tray. And then out of that sampling tray, I think you worked for another 10 minutes, pulled that out, preserved that, sent that to Stevens Point. So my question is, how did you make sure that you weren't how did you make sure you were pulling a representative sample out of that plastic tray and not just pulling the cool ones or the, the big ones or <laughs> the attractive ones, whatever? No, that's uh, that's uh, um, an excellent question and uh, something I thought a lot about along the way. Um, the uh, advice that I got on that was if you have that kind of time to to pick or to choose uh, when you start to accumulate one species that um, the numbers are trying to accum uh, accumulate, let's say into the area 15, 20 specimens, you stop collecting that one and go to something different. But you're exactly right. It, some of these little things are so beautiful and <laughs> so exciting. You just want to keep getting more of them. And there's a, you know, the, I, I can't totally rule out some bias in that sampling but the interesting thing is if you if you have a tray that you've just uh, just put specimens into and you're that far along um you're 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 getting kind of you're hopefully you're nearly getting to the end of the diversity there and the and what we do with the multi-habitat is to uh, look at it in total in species numbers not in numbers of individuals uh, i don't know if that answers exactly but that's kind of the thinking behind it. I just want to ask that because it's my understanding that the same principle will ask well, they are both American and North Carolina. Yes. So you're not, it's not you who is now observing, it's gone to a lab and some of that 
concerned that we could potentially just get the book of Acts and it would follow in that way? Sure, but um, if you've if if you've skewed it and they're sampling randomly, you can it could follow. <laughs> okay, another question over here. Uh, my question is, um, with the removal of the dam, what kind of changes, if any, do you expect to happen? You know, this is a huge project and a huge upside for the Kinney. So both of those impoundments have been there about 100 years, and both have collected sediment that's been deposited in them to the point that they're nearly full. And uh, a lot of the pollutants that are have, have come along with that sediment, like nutrients, fuel algae blooms on these lakes. And they're hy hy what's called hyper-eutrophic, which means they're hyper-green. And that's what they are. It's either rooted vegetation coming out of the bottom because it's so shallow, or it's floating vegetation on top, which plugs it from the top down. So in terms of aquatic life potential, it's very minimal. And um, habitat degradation is severe because it's all sand and silt, which is usually not populated by aquatic invertebrates. Although, now that you mention it, I'm going to go back to hexagenia for a minute because it's my favorite bug. Um, we have not collected hex, and I'll get back to your question. Um, we have not collected hexagenia in the Kinney, except for I think one of your sites in uh, 2001 down near the mouth, near the St. Croix, where there's a depositional delta at the mouth of the Kinney. However, uh, these hexagenia bileniata were collected in downtown River Falls uh, early July 2022. And uh, I'm guessing they were, they were collected at the gas station, the holiday station on the south end of town under the lights one evening by, by John Wheeler. And I'm betting that they came from Lake George because of the, all the fine silt and sediment that's built up in that lake. So um, both our water quality and the habitat nightmares, dam removal will uh, and draw down of those lakes and the opportunity to create literally a new Kinnikinnick River through a mile. Can you imagine that? It's almost a mile from Division Street down to um, the spot in the river 504-ish, which is below the Powell Falls Dam. So imagine a new river and restoration of the waterfalls that define Oh, River Falls. Um, so, yeah, and part of the monitoring plan we put together was to evaluate exactly that. What are the ecological benefits of dam removal and river restoration from a biological and ecological perspective? So we're in the process of doing the pre-restoration monitoring right now. Once those dams are gone, the river is restored, we'll go back and repeat it and we'll hopefully have a pre-post comparison with all of the ecological improvements documented. Clark, um, I know it's early in the 2022 or this present study. How about uh, ephemerella and nermis? Have you seen more or less so far or about the same? It's, it's been about the same. I think um, what I've noticed is now, what, what has happened in the meantime is enormous became um, excruciant. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so, um, but what's what's been interesting and in just in looking at the data so far is we're getting a lot of nidamine, which is the smaller of the sulfur. So um, that's the only thing that I can, I've seen so far, but I don't have the data to, to actually, uh, you know, uh, quantify that. Clark, I wondered, have you noticed any uh, changes in the dates of, uh, of hatches because of climate change? I, I haven't because I haven't kept track of hatches. Well, let me ask one other question then. Um, just one second. Yeah. Um, you had such a negative introduction to this slide presentation mm -hmm. and then such a positive result. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, is the Kinney unique? Um, well, I think Kent's slide, which we, we decided to put in, um, sort of turned that, that ominous uh, scenario around because um, we discovered some papers that, that really, really said it differently. And I think the idea of this, the lo sort of the local and the, uh, the the disturbance being maybe more of a, a more local effect, and the idea that maybe efforts can be directed towards those kinds of disturbances is is, is very promising. Um, a lot of those, um, the only one of those larger declines that we had in that one that second slide or third slide was the one. Um, the only one that was from the U.S. was from uh, the Pacific Coast hibernating monarchs, and um, which is obviously quite serious. But a lot of these papers have come out of Europe, and it, there's some real interesting uh, background to, you know, what kinds of uh, geographic locations they were in. And um, if you're if you're interested in that, I can follow up on that better with. Uh, maybe some specific um, papers or examples. But what it, you know, what it boils down to. Oh, could moment. you talk in the mic, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, what it boils down to is a lot of the questions that we are asking or would like to ask are data deficient. Um, and that was one of the big things Clark mentioned too, is there are just data cat gaps that uh, we have no information to make any conclusions so but um, yeah overall I think the Kinney is in good shape but you've seen a small subset of the results so far so we say that with caution but optimism isn't I think it's kind of interesting because hasn't River Falls seen a pretty good population increase in recent years yes and one of Kayaptawish um, early um, emphases was on urbanization in the River Falls area and specifically working with them on stormwater management. And uh, they came a long ways over a decade and preceded a lot of the stormwater management efforts across the state of River Falls before permits were even required to treat stormwater by municipalities. So they have an ordinance now that's probably one of the best in the Midwest for treating stormwater. And uh, while urban footprint in the Kinney is not significant, it's pretty much limited to River Falls, but it is kind of smack dab right in the middle of the watershed. So it could have a big impact on points downstream. But uh, so that's again, the issue of identifying stressors and being an advocate for the resource, that's what we need to do um, as Trout Unlimited. So getting back to Andy's question on uh, Femorella and, and Excruzion, so there is some, I think there's some evidence, anecdotal perhaps, that that species is kind of, kind of in trouble. And it's reported that it's gone from Black Earth Creek. Anybody, anybody fish Black Earth Creek? And, uh, the pale morning dun, I think that's what they call it. And uh, I think the jury's still out on the rush as to how, how it's doing in the rush, but I'm, I'm kind of worried about it. Andy's worried about that too. Hey, can I just point out, uh, you guys may know that I, I tie a few flies from time to time, right? So one of my first real, ins my first real instruct instructor was John Mowry. So between John and then Andy, they really gave me the beginning of my fly tying. So thanks, guys. All right, we have we have Zoom questions here. We have Zoom questions. Which one do you want to do? All of them. How come our board members are leaving? <laughs> yeah. So we have a few Zoom questions. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, first question from Tom Pharisee. What impact do local mosquito control measures have on the overall insect population? Um, I have no clue. Uh, but I would suspect they probably do what, to some extent, what they're intended to do, and that is suppress mosquito populations, especially in the Twin Cities, because that's what we want to see. 
and it's an it's a, you know it's it's an ongoing battle in order to do something like that uh, take on something of that magnitude you have to be persistent and uh, do it annually but um, it's a it's a disease vector too so you've got that piece the public health perspective as well to consider so none of these issues are easy all of them tend to be complex when you're talking about insect populations in the natural world okay uh here's a question from william hibbard uh, when the 2002 and 2020 studies were done, did you try to do them at approximately the same dates and water temperatures? And if not, why not? Um, yes, we uh, designed all the recollections, the, uh, the return uh, sample um, processing, we matched them up sometimes to the day with the 20 years previous. Sometimes we couldn't quite swing that, but they're all very, very close. Um, there's some limitations on when the HBIs, the single habitat can be done. So there's a window for those. And then we were trying to match up whenever I got out to get the samples done, say in June for, uh, for multi-habitat. But uh, they're, they're very, very close. Now we didn't have uh, degree days or we didn't have water temperatures or anything like that for those. We just went straight with the dates. Okay. And uh, the last question, at least we have for now, is from Jared B. And this is a ringer question. It's, uh, is there any way that we could get involved in any future samplings or parts of this project or other studies? Who's we? I assume TCTU members, perhaps. I I think this means TCTU members. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think we've pretty much got uh, the Kinney macroinvertebrate monitoring project under control in terms of field volunteer time, and uh, recognize that there's also a lot of volunteer time involved in um, analyzing all of this data reporting on the data, disseminating it, communicating it, uh, creating presentations. So I think we've, we've pretty much got all of that covered. Um, what I see groups like this, and the same for Kayaptowish, your, your primary role, I think, is a resource advocate. You know, the more numbers, the better in terms of communicating what needs to be done about stressors? Clark mentioned neonics. They're banned in Europe. Why aren't they banned here in the United States? The effects are the same. It's politics. So how is politics driven? It's hopefully driven by the democratic process of our representatives listening to what we have to say and speaking on behalf of the resource. And that means the more the merrier. <laughs> so I think that's that's where these organizations can really weigh in on uh, resource conservation and restoration. Uh, now, having said that, Jim and his monitoring team do a great job of monitoring um, a lot of your trout waters in the Twin Cities metro area here and uh, environs close by. So the monitoring piece is important and the long-term monitoring is uh, even better. Uh, longevity means cost and persistence more than anything else. So you got to have both. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Th thank you.